Well, good morning. Much like the last song that our worship team did on the set, this message is going to be a lot more worshipful than fun. Andre, I don't even know what that means, but uh, yeah, I'm going to remember that. (laughs) Hey, just before we get into our message this morning, I do want to uh, remind you that last week we did a uh, brief presentation on uh, a gift that we want to give to you called Right Now Media. Uh, Right Now Media, it is a media streaming service, uh, a Christian media streaming service that really does have something for everybody. It's got a huge children's section. It's got a huge uh, section for church leaders. Um, It's got a a, a large collection of sessions from different uh, conferences. And uh, this is our gift to you. And uh, the Discipleship Commission has bought a, a... Uh, church subscription for this and uh, we want to uh, encourage all of you to sign up for that the back of the church there is um, some sign up sheets and uh, Greg are you going to have your computer here today so Greg can actually sign you up today if that is something you're interested in so you can uh, see him later and he would love nothing more than to get you get you hooked up to that let's bow our heads just before we get started this morning God, I want to thank you again for this this morning. I want to thank you for our worship, for the powerful words of those songs. Father, I pray that you would just open up our hearts to whatever it is you want us to come away this morning with. In your name we pray. Amen. So my week started on Monday with an email from Andre, and uh, he said, you know, Bruce Singh, this is your last... Uh, your last Sunday here, um, I'm wondering if you want to choose the playlist for the morning, uh, for the Sunday morning. So anyways, I uh, was in a particularly goofy mood and put together a playlist that included everything from, oh, I think a couple of U2 songs. There, yeah, there's my, I think there was an Elvis. There might even have been a Snoop Dogg song in there. So I I don't know. But anyways, I'm, I'm very glad that you... Uh, you didn't do that. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, Monica and I, as I've mentioned, uh, I think once or twice during my messages over the last many months, uh, Monica and I have both done a lot of premarital counseling with couples. And one of the things that we very often do is uh, we will do our six or eight sessions before the wedding, but we'll very often uh, have a session with the couple after they've been married uh, four to six months, uh, if it works out for that to take place. And um, it's it's very interesting, uh, some of the things that happen during the adjustment of them actually getting married, moving in, living together for that period of time. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes they need help dealing with issues that aren't very serious. I mean, maybe it's a a difference of opinion on something that they both will acknowledge that it's a a fairly minor thing, while other times there are more significant relationship-defining issues that they're dealing with. And the conversations that we have with them usually start off with one of the couples saying something like this, I just don't understand my wife, or I just don't understand my husband. Ever caught yourself saying that? I remember as a youth pastor, I used to have parents come to me all the time, and Andre can probably attest to this, and saying what? I just don't understand my child. As a youth pastor, we would have our students come to us and say, I just don't understand my parents. As employees, there are times when we've all complained about work, and we've said what? I just can't understand my boss. For those of us who are employers, there are times when we've all said, I just I just can't understand my employees. Maybe you have said to one another after a Sunday morning service, I just can't understand that guy that preached this morning. But you know, I've always found those statements to be rather interesting because they all come with an assumption that we're supposed to be able to get to the point where eventually we're all going to understand each other, right? Do you think that that's true? When I'm talking with husbands about this issue related to their wives, I usually suggest that the best place for them to start is to actually purchase this t-shirt. It says, I don't need Google. My wife knows everything. 
And when I'm talking with wives, I encourage them to get this t-shirt. I don't need Google. My husband knows everything. But sometimes it goes way beyond that, and it looks more like this. If you were my husband, I'd poison your coffee. And the husband says, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. But you know, somehow, we all believe that we should always be able to understand the people in our lives all of the time. Do you think that's true? I think that we like it when people are predictable. We like it when we can put people in this nice, neat, definable package. We value being able to know and understand what we're getting from somebody, don't we? And I wonder if sometimes we are ever guilty of carrying that attitude or idea into our concept of God. Have you ever struggled to understand what God is doing? Why he's put you where you are? Why he's allowing you to go through what you are? Why in the world he would allow your circumstances to lead you to this place? Have you ever said, God, I just don't understand you? I think if we're honest this morning, we've likely all been there. And I certainly don't mean what I'm about to say is being an overly derogatory statement, although I am, uh, it's likely going to come out that way. But you know, some of the most biblically literate, theologically intelligent, some of the most well-educated seminary trained people that I have known are also people whose personal faith is far from something that I would want to emulate. You know, some of those people who've spent years and years and years of their lives putting scripture under a microscope, and trying to dissect who this God is, trying to define him and put him in a box. They they try and turn him into something predictable and maybe even eventually get to the point where they think they have this God thing, this faith thing all figured out. Well, I kind of think that it's those people that have maybe missed the point. It's those people who are often the ones who have lost this shock and awe effect that God can and is supposed to have in our lives. Again, we all have this tendency, maybe it's a natural tendency, to want to understand and to want to define and to want to box things up in a way that makes something easy for us to understand. But if you translate that to your faith and your understanding of God, then you end up losing some of the most important aspects of what faith was actually intended to be. You end up losing your awe of God. You end up forgetting that, as the psalmist reminds us, he cannot be measured. Nothing can compare to him. He is limitless. You can spend your life trying to understand his ways, and you will not even have scratched the surface by the end of it. But his love is, his love and his patience and his power, they're immeasurable. I think we try so hard to box him and confine him to a book and create him to be something that we can wrap our heads around him by doing that. I wonder, do we lose some of the reasons why he is actually so worthy of our worship? And you know, this morning, I want us to try and think about what would happen if we spent less time trying to figure him out and more time just being in awe of who he is. I want us to try and break open your box and maybe that maybe you've put him in and maybe even try this morning to remove him from that box. I want us to try and become comfortable in our understanding that we can worship and we can be in awe of and value God simply by acknowledging that we will never come close to understanding his ways. My hope is that for uh, that we can maybe come to grips with the fact that in some ways God will never be understood. And I guess the big question is, why is that? And this morning we want to talk about why we so often have a hard time understanding him, and maybe more than that, I want us to try and become comfortable with not understanding him. I want to suggest to you this morning that there are a number of reasons why we will never fully be able to understand God. And the first reason that I want to talk about is that God is not bound by our definition of life and death. And he shows this so many times in Scripture, doesn't it? I mean, think about it. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He healed people who were on their deathbed. 
Jesus himself conquered death. But, you know, Jesus himself in Luke chapter 8 demonstrates in an incredibly powerful way that he's not bound by the definitions of life and death that we carry with us. I know that many of you are already familiar with this story, so let me just recap it. Because Luke is telling the story of an encounter that Jesus had with this guy named Jairus, who was a a Jewish religious leader who came to Jesus. He very much humbled himself and pleaded for Jesus to help him. Jairus told Jesus that he had a 12-year-old daughter and that she was very sick and that she was about to die. And in that particular moment, Jesus was surrounded, we're told, by this multitude of people who were all waiting for him to heal them of all kinds of illnesses and physical deformities. And Jairus, at this point, was likely one of the hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, all wanting to... wanting Jesus to do something for him. In fact, at one point, we're told in this passage that Jesus was being crushed because of the multitude of people that were pushing against him. So while Jairus is obviously waiting his turn for an audience with Jesus, we're told in Luke chapter 8 that someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter's dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. I mean, can you imagine that moment for this dad? He leaves his dying daughter's bedside to seek out the help of the only one that he believes can really help her and isn't even there when she passes away. So Jesus overhears this bad news being given to the man and without skipping a beat, he looks at him and picks him out of the crowd. And he doesn't say, I'm sorry for your loss. But he responds to him by saying something that would have left this whole crowd probably believing that Jesus was crazy. Jesus said to him, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. So the same faith that brought Jairus to Jesus in the first place was now being carried back to his home as Jesus and the disciples followed him to where his daughter was lying dead. And as they were about to learn, God was not bound by their definition of life and death. The story continues in chapter 8, when we're told when he, that being Jesus, arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. I mean, the people outside, they were sad. They were distraught for the family. I mean, imagine, they had likely watched this 12-year-old girl grow up from the time she was a baby, and now she was no longer with them. And they understood from a human level, death was final. I mean, death represented the end. Death meant that she was gone from their lives. And humanly speaking, wailing and mourning was the appropriate and the heartfelt reaction to the grief in their hearts that they were feeling. Well, God isn't bound by our definition of life and death. And the passage goes on to tell us that Jesus spoke directly to the crowd of mourners. And he said, stop wailing. She's not dead, but asleep. And on hearing this, they all stopped crying and started praising God, right? Nope. Verse 53 tells us that this is how they reacted. It says, they laughed at him knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. And her spirit returned. And at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Then Jesus did something that a lot of people, even today, have tried to figure out. I mean, if Jesus was looking for followers, right, you'd expect him to say, Let's get the word out about this, people. Let's tell everybody that we're doing something new here than... And that God even has the power to bring somebody back to life now. The disciples were likely kind of wringing their hands together and saying, you know, it wasn't hours ago that he was being crushed by the crowds of people. He was popular then. But can you imagine when people hear about this, how they're going to respond? That was the disciples' reaction. The parents' reaction was quite different because, understandably, they were shocked and probably overwhelmed. Their happiness was likely tempered by some amount of fear. 
Verse 56 says her parents were astonished, but Jesus ordered them not to tell anybody what had happened. It's as if Jesus said, shh, don't tell anybody. I think that Jesus knew that deep down that people were starting to come to him, not because of the message of hope and life and forgiveness, but they were coming to him because they wanted to see a show. They wanted to be entertained. They wanted to see something supernatural. They wanted to be entertained. And Jesus didn't want to entertain them, and he didn't want these supernatural and unexplainable human events to detract from the great message that he really came to bring. These people had just experienced in a very real and tangible way the shock and the awe of the living and loving and active God that's not bound by our human boundaries of life and death. Well, the second reason why we will never fully be able to understand God, simply put, is this. God is not bound by our definition of time and space. You know, in chapter 8, we come across this very strange story, and I will admit it is a strange story, of Philip baptizing this man when all of a sudden he's transported someplace else. Uh, So for all of you Star Trek fans, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about the transporter, right? That's what you're thinking about? Well, it's kind of like that. In fact, we're told in verse 39 of of Acts chapter 8, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch didn't see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared in Ostis and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. So just when you think that this had to have been a one-time occurrence, you realize that the Old Testament, this happened a number of times as well. In the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah experienced this particular miracle so many times that he actually became known to his friends and family for it. Did you know that? And people assumed that when they were with him, that it was likely that if God needed him, he was just going to disappear like that and be transported someplace else. He might be just transported away during a conversation. Poof. He might just pop up and disappear in one place and reappear in another. Can you imagine you might be sitting at a Tim Hortons with him enjoying breakfast and poof, he would leave his half-eaten breakfast sandwich on the table. You might be out for dinner with him and poof, he stiffs you with the bill, that guy. But wait, God needed him somewhere else. And because God is not governed by our idea of time and space, he can do that. In one instance where Elijah was with the king and he was worried that he might be shifted or transported somewhere else, it's recorded in 1 Kings that he said this, I don't know where the Spirit of the Lord may carry me when I leave you. He said that to the king. I also find it kind of amusing that if you know Elijah's story, then you know that we're told he was actually carried up to heaven and didn't experience human death the way that we do. But that his fellow prophets, at the time that he was taken to heaven, didn't even realize that he had actually been taken to heaven. And the story is actually quite funny to read. I'd encourage you to go read it. So they're sitting around talking to each other, and Elijah's gone, and one of them says, well, perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has picked him up and set him down on some mountain or in some valley. They just had no idea where he was. Defining the normal laws, or defying the normal laws of time and space are an everyday occurrence for God, and he's not bound to them in the same way that we are. Not to belabor this point, but in John chapter 6, John tells of an encounter that Jesus had with his disciples that also showed this. And I know that most of you are familiar with most of this story. We're told that after a long day, The disciples were looking to travel across this lake. And in verse 16, it says, When evening came, his disciples went to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. So as if Jesus walking on the water wasn't enough of a miracle, something else happened that we so often overlook here. Because we're told in verse 21 
that then they were willing to take him into the boat, which was a great decision on their part. Don't you agree? But it says, and then the real kicker is this, because we're then told that once he got into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. So God time and time again showed that he is never bound to our laws of time and space. Well, that's the second reason. The third reason why we will never fully be able to understand God is that he is not bound by our laws of science. And there are so many stories and encounters in the 66 books of our Bible that make the scientific world sit back and really scratch their heads. Things that people have tried to figure out scientifically to see if there's actually any scientific explanation for how those things could happen. And something that you learn pretty quick as you read scripture is that God is absolutely not bound by the laws of science. I don't know how much time you've personally spent reading the book of Acts, but you can't read the book without having a few of those head-scratching moments, as if to say, did that really just happen? And one of those is found actually in Acts 19, and it reads, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. I mean, what do we even do with that? Now what we do, it gets even better than that because in verse 13 of chapter 19, he says this. He says, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all and gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. So I was going to say, now try and visualize that, but actually don't try too hard and visualize that. But when we hear these stories of these unexplainable things that really don't make a lot of human sense, you wonder, how would we have responded? Well, this is how the people back then responded. When this became known, we read in verse 17, when this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came out and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. You have to admit, our our God works sometimes in some very strange and mysterious ways. And he works with people and things that cannot be explained by science. The reality of our God is that what sets us apart from every other belief system is that our God shows up in history. He shows up in these moments and he does what it takes to grab people's attention. And what we have to understand is that when these traumatic and dramatic events are happening, the Holy Spirit is using them to change the hearts of individuals. I love this. The official Jewish definition of a miracle is this. It's an extraordinary event manifesting what? It's manifesting divine intervention into human affairs. The unofficial definition, and the one that I particularly like, is that God has just shown up. And when he does, he is not bound by the laws of science. You know, the final point that I want to make this morning, and maybe this is the most personal one to you and I, and I hope that you will let this sink in, but God is not bound by our concept of who he is. You know, it's like we said earlier, we all have a box that we at times are guilty of putting God in, a box that will define him and confine him. And you know, the Pharisees were especially guilty of that. They spent so much time studying not just the Torah, but the other ancient Jewish writings as well. And they really thought, they really sincerely believed 
that they had God figured out. They thought they had the inside track and that they were the smartest ones around and they let the world know that. But at the end of the day, Jesus told them that their hearts were far from the heart of God. And you know, my fear is that there's a lot of Christians and maybe some here that are like that. And it gets to the point where we think that we have got all figured out and when we spend our lives developing this mental picture of who he is and what he does and what he's like. And when we finally think we have him figured out, we usually realize that we are far from his heart and we realize that we have missed the point. And hear this, because God is always bigger than our concept of who he is. One of the reasons why I love the Psalms so much, and I know other people love the Psalms so much as well, is because when you read the Psalms, you get the understanding that David really spent less of his time trying to figure out and understand God, and much more time simply in awe of who he was. You get the sense that David is interacting with God in a way that puts both he and God in their rightful places. You get the impression that David has pushed aside the need to understand and simply worships God for who he is. David has embraced the shock and the awe of God, and he expresses it in such a beautiful way in the Psalms. Listen to this excerpt from Psalm 147. It says, Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars and he calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of a horse, nor in the delight in the legs of a warrior. The Lord delights in what? In those who fear him. He sends his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. And this part I'm pretty sure he wrote for us in Winnipeg. But he says he spreads the snow like wool and scatters the frost like ashes. He hurls down his hail like pebbles. Who can withstand his icy blast? He sends his word and melts them. He stirs up his breezes and the waters flow. Praise the Lord. My friends, these words are written by a man who has come to grips with the fact that God is up there and we are down here. That God's understanding is up there and our understanding is down here. That God's power is up there and our power is down here. His wisdom is up there while our wisdom is down here. As I was preparing for this message this morning, I started thinking about how our concept of God is usually formed or shaped. And really, our concept of God is often shaped by our upbringing, isn't it? It's shaped by our experiences. It's shaped by our own personal studying. But please understand that your concept of God is never going to be able to encompass who he really is. And the big question is, can you live with that? Elsa Einstein, who is the wife of Albert Einstein, debatedly one of the most brilliant minds of the last century, was quoted as saying this. He says, no, I don't understand my husband's theory of relativity, but I know my husband, and I know that he can be trusted. As I read that quote, I found myself wondering, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all say that about the God that we serve? We may not understand him, his ways are so far from our ways and his wisdom so far from ours. But maybe that is just another reason to worship how great and how powerful he really is 
You know, as we close this morning, I'm going to ask you in just a minute to stand with me, and I'm going to invite you to close your eyes right where you are. And all I want you to do is to listen to these words from Psalm chapter 8, making them your own prayer this morning. Would you stand with me and close your eyes? Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens through the praise of children and infants. You have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you even care for them. You made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God, I want to thank you so much. Thank you for being so much bigger than we could ever, ever imagine you to be. So much wiser, so much more powerful, so much more loving and patient. And Father, we apologize to you that there are times when All of us are so guilty of confining you and defining you in our little theological box. But Father, we acknowledge to you this morning that you are majestic and you are worthy of our praise because of how incredibly awesome you are. May we leave this place this morning acknowledging that and may we live our lives in awe of how great you truly are. In your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated.